Hello, I'm Derek Bain. I'm a mountaineering instructor here at Glenmore Lodge and I'm about to introduce the B Avalanche Aware process or guidelines for you. Uh, the idea is that you can uh, listen to this video and then when you're out in the hill with your instructors you can ask more questions and of course they'll be filling in a lot of details for you. This process has come around due to the fact that 90% of people trigger their own avalanches. Despite being educated in avalanche uh, avoidance, people still get avalanched. So this process has human factors and you and your party central to your decision making process. Have a look at this video. This shows a typical Scottish avalanche. There's plenty to take away from this, but what I want you to look at in particular is the background here. You can see that this slope is relatively bare, whereas in the foreground we have the snow that actually avalanched, and this is accumulated because it's been blown there. You can actually see quite a lot of uh, snow has collected to depth at the bottom of that slope. So here's an outline of our decision-making process. We have uh, the avalanche hazard, weather and mountain conditions. We have you and your party and we have the landscape that you intend to visit. If we consider all three of those, um, we can have a well-formed decision. Uh, in addition to that, we need to consider those at three key phases throughout your uh, day. The first is the planning and this can be at home, uh, even uh, weeks before you go out um, and then once we have a plan we need to monitor uh, the conditions you and your party and landscape throughout your journey and at certain key places during the day or times we'll have to reconsider whether and conditions you and your party and the landscape or train you're visiting um, and this process helps us develop a routine that we can use to make sure that we are making uh, good decisions. So there's an outline of the whole process, the planning, the journey and the key phases, uh, places, and we're gonna work through these in turn. Starting with planning, we'll look at, again, weather and conditions, terrain or landscape, and you and your party. When we're considering weather and conditions, we're, what we mean is we're going to gather weather and snowpack information. There's two key mountain weather forecasts that we uh, use as standard. These um, help us compare different forecasts using different models, computer models, which means that if there's any discrepancy or difference between the, the forecasts, then it gives us a little bit of heads up um, and what to monitor on the hill. Of course, there's other uh, sites we can use, particularly for skiing, etc. Um, but we do have to bear in mind that some sources have a commercial aspect to them. So we need to uh, take some advice from certain locations with a pinch of salt. The key information we want to get from these forecasts typically is the wind speed and direction, the precipitation, timing, intensity, um, whether it's rain or snow, uh, and the freezing level. These will dictate the kind of conditions we'd expect on the hill. A key place to get avalanche hazard information is the Scottish Avalanche Information Service. This is a screenshot from that website. There's lots of information on the website itself. Uh, plenty of education, I encourage you to go and explore it and you will see a lot more uh, detail with your instructor on your course. What you see on the screen at the moment is the actual forecast page of the site 
Um, to explain what happens here, um, observers go out on the hill every day in six areas in Scotland. That's Torden in the northwest, Loch Aber, Glencoe, Craig Meggie, Northern Cairngorms and the Southern Cairngorms. So we've got a bit of a east-west split with Craig Meggie in the middle. And uh, the observers go onto the hill, they do a journey uh, making observations about um, the snow level, the snow quantities, where it's accumulated and what it's doing. Is it uh, thawing? Is it stabilising? Uh, is it destabilising? Etc, etc. So they do a journey, they get a big picture of what's happening with the snow and then in combination with the weather forecast they come up with the avalanche forecast. Um, on the top left hand corner of the page you'll see um, a compass rose and that has the avalanche hazard marked on it by altitude and aspect and then on the right hand side there is the avalanche hazard scale from low up to very high. Um, quite a complicated scale, uh, your instructor will explain more to you about what these hazard levels mean but it's basically a likelihood and consequence scale. At the low hazard level there's low likelihood um, with low consequence at very high, it's at very likely with a very high consequence uh, and everything in between. And then down below there we've got the weather influences and that describes um, the information that the SAIS service will get from the Met Office which is a specialist forecast just for the SAIS. Um, and then obviously the weather dictates what happens with the snowpack um, over the day. So below that then is the weather influences on the snowpack. Um, here we'll identify the detail around um, where the, the hazardous snow will be, uh, what it will be, uh, what aspects it's on, uh, altitude it's on, etc, etc. And then it will describe the overall hazard level. At the bottom there we have uh, uh, little symbols that describe what actually the type of avalanche problem is we're dealing with. For example, wind slab, um, old unstable layers, cornice collapse or thaw instability. And again your instructors will go into more detail about that. The map on the right hand side here um, is, is not actually a physical map that we create or it's not on the, the SAIS website. This is just to kind of illustrate really what is going on in our heads when we um, process information from the forecast. We need to be able to look at a, uh, a mountain map and translate the information that's in the avalanche forecast onto the map. So we need to identify altitude and aspect, steep ground and um, identify where the hazard is on the map so we can avoid it on the hill. You'll see there's a lot of area on that map that isn't actually coloured in with any avalanche hazard. That's because that ground is not steep enough and you wouldn't actually consider it as avalanche hazard. So with the weather uh, and conditions reports, we then go on to uh, identify mountain landscape um, where the avalanche hazard may be. So what we're talking about there when it comes to avalanche terrain is identifying aspect, angles and altitude. Um, avalanche terrain or avalanches start and terrain that is uh, steep enough, that's between 30 degrees and 45 degrees with a sweet spot around 38 degrees. So we can use either a ruler and measure the index contour, so 30 degrees is equal to six index contours in a centimetre, 45 degrees is 10 index contours in a centimetre. Uh, there's other tools out there that you can use to help uh, identify slope angle. Um, the one up in the top right is from uh, the Shaven Lasbury website. So using the weather and conditions and uh, your map reading skills, we can then come up with a, a route plan. 
Um, so this looks quite busy, but um, if you're mainly um, out on foot, then look, just look at the, the left-hand map. If you're mainly out on ski, then look at the, the right-hand map. So that still has the avalanche hazard uh, marked roughly as it was uh, described in the, the avalanche forecast. But now we've got routes marked on. Um, and in certain locations, we've also got the symbol for key places marked on. So these key places are generally in places where you have multiple choices for routes or options. So for example, where the arrow is pointing there, you can see there's a dotted line coming out from the main routes as alternatives. You'll also note that the, uh, the main routes avoid the actual avalanche hazard. Um, in that case, for the on foot one, it's going uh, up a ridge or alternatively round, uh, round the quarries, staying off uh, or away from hazardous uh, snowpack and terrain. One of the most important parts now to consider is whether your plan, the terrain choices, the hazard, etc., is appropriate for you and your party. How experienced are you? Um, do you all in, have the same goals, aspirations and attitudes? Um, has the plan been communicated? Was everyone involved? And do they feel that they all have a voice uh, and understand the plan? Is there any individual roles within the group? Is there a leader? Is there anyone in particular who uh, is less involved? Is there a navigator? Can these roles be shared? And then also, what equipment is required and do you have the skills to use them? For example, the people in the photograph on the left there are on relatively steep ground. If they were unfamiliar with moving on that terrain with uh, crampons and axes, their main focus is perhaps on that and not the avalanche hazard. And of course, um, if it's a poor visibility day and you're in a complex terrain, with poor visibility, can you comfortably navigate in that situation and uh, will you be able to know exactly where you are relative to avalanche hazard throughout the journey? Without considering these human factors, there is a danger that we uh, bite off more than we can chew and end up with a plan that is uh, not possible for us to, to complete safely. So then moving on, once we have our plan, um, we can go out on our journey and there we have to monitor what's happening with the conditions and whether everything uh, is working out as forecast. So for example, at the planning stage, the avalanche forecast said there would be new snowfall, which would be heaviest overnight and during the morning. Has this turned out to be the case? Um, look out the window first thing in the morning. Is there lots of snow or is there not? Um, you might have to journey to um, the hill. Um, what do you see on the journey? Um, does it match the forecast or not? Throughout the journey, we want to be monitoring the things that are important um, uh, and will have an influence on avalanche hazard as dictated by the, the forecast. So again, the forecast said strong south, uh, strong southerly winds will back north, then southwesterly. So we want to be monitoring the wind speed and direction to make sure that it matches the forecast. Um, that is relatively easy when you have good visibility like the picture on the left and you can identify where the snow is blowing from and to. Whereas in uh, poor visibility, um, you might have to use local features like boulders. Throughout the journey, we also need to monitor the landscape and how the terrain is influencing the avalanche hazard. Um, on the left-hand side of this picture, we see uh, the original map and the uh, compass rose from the avalanche forecast. We need to bear that in mind and compare it to the landscape, uh, particularly aspect, altitude and angles, and identify how they uh, match to create avalanche hazard. Also, with good visibility, we'll be able to potentially 
identify the start zones and tracks and run out zones of any avalanche hazard uh, and therefore adapt our route to take that into account. We also need to consider you and your party throughout the journey. So we want to be monitoring our physical and mental state. Um, this can be influenced by the conditions. Um, and one of the big things that we um, may not realize is that the party dynamics, if you like, are changing. Uh, if we're all internal in our thoughts and not sharing what we're thinking, then we can our decisions can be flawed. So is everyone coping with conditions expected or not? Uh, and that's a big question you need to ask yourself uh, throughout the journey. But these influences on our decision making are called human factors. Uh, there's a lot of um, cognitive biases that influence our decision. And mainly that goes unnoticed and unchecked and uh, actually is a good thing for our, our, our decision making. These uh, mental rules of thumb are called heuristics. Uh, they happen unconsciously and they help us make decisions without too much effort in our, our normal life. However, in the avalanche world, um, it has been recognised that these uh, heuristics can actually um, get us into trouble. Uh, and in that case, it's called a heuristic trap. These heuristic traps occur at an unconscious level um, where our brain is uh, taking shortcuts to make decisions and perhaps not fully um, recognising um, the, the hazard from, from avalanche. Uh, there are six of them listed on uh, this slide. Um, I'm only going to talk about one of them, I think. Um, as an example, you can talk a lot more with your instructors about this on your course. So take um, this picture here. Um, we have a couple of climbers in the background on a, on a climb. Um, and if you put yourself in the, the shoes of the photographer here, you've arrived on scene and uh, your intention is to go climbing um, on the, the same cliff. If you also notice in the foreground, there's um, some signs of instability some thought instability with uh, roller, roller wheels or roller balls and there's even perhaps a small slide in the very uh, foreground. Um, so the conditions um, and your observations are perhaps showing you that um, there is instability and it's perhaps not a good idea to wander onto these uh, steeper slopes on the approach to the climb but of course there are other people around and there are other people on the cliff that you want to go to and that, that could influence your decision. Um, this heuristic or hysteristic trap is called social proof. And that is that um, other people being around is actually influencing your decision making. And perhaps if you're being more logical and working through the situation, um, you wouldn't actually approach that cliff. Um, so there's been many accidents that have um, occurred under that label of uh, social proof. So in addition to the monitoring that we're doing throughout the day, there are or will be key places where we need to carefully reconsider the situation. It might be we're just updating uh, the weathering conditions, you and your party, and uh, the terrain factors all together again. Um, so we'll run through some of that. So um, in terms of the weathering conditions, we need to make sure that we're actually updating properly. Um, are the conditions uh, and avalanche problems uh, as forecasted? Uh, has it changed throughout the day? Um, have you um, spent any time recently thinking about uh, the problems? Is there a wind slab problem and has it changed as the day has gone on? Uh, and if so, can we change the plan at this key place to avoid the hazard or to um, change the route because it's not as it was initially predicted at the beginning of the day. When it comes to mountain landscape, there might be um, a lot more you can see at your key place than you could at the beginning of the day or throughout the journey earlier on. 
Um, so when we're at a key place, if we have good visibility, then we might actually be able to break down a key slope into uh, individual smaller landscape components or slope anatomy. Things like convex rolls or ridges, gullies and benches all have an influence on avalanche hazard, either in a positive or negative way. So for example, uh, ridges like the one in the, the picture on the left there, um, ridges are often uh, not large accumulation zones. And as you can see in that, that photograph, there's actually boulders poking through the snow there, um, and that will provide a, a safe way to uh, descend that slope. Other um, small slope features like convexities have a negative influence on the avalanche hazard, so we want to try and avoid the convexities. And of course, um, small scale features that won't necessarily appear in the map might, won't be obvious until potentially you're at a key place. Um, when it comes to skiing, um, you may have the opportunity to um, micro adjust your ski line, for example, at a key place. Um, in this picture, you can see in the background there's a steep slope, certainly steep enough um, for avalanches to start, and there's also um, some loading on those slopes that you would want to avoid. Not only that, um, that slope that the skier is on is potentially within a runout zone, so um, no doubt here that the skier's chosen a line further right away from those cliffs to avoid that, that runout zone. So the, the key place allows us to see uh, potentially small slope features. And when it comes to you and your party, well then, this is really the last chance to make sure that your uh, decision making is not being influenced unduly by external factors. So in poor weather, like in this picture, obviously um, there's, there's a lot of focus on <laughs> probably personal well-being. Um, why can't I get this helmet done up properly? I wish I'd brought my goggles. And that's going to um, uh, distract you from the, the decisions around avalanche. Um, ask your instructor on the hill about some uh, decision support tools that are available, like thinking hats and devil's advocate. And uh, of course, lastly, there may be uncertainty in your decision making. And that's okay. It might be like in this example on the right, um, where the visibility is quite poor and this is a key place if you're intending to approach those cliffs and go climbing because you can't see everything that you would like to. There is obviously fresh snow around, uh, the lighter coloured snow. There's dark snow that might offer, which will be likely older snow and more stable snow, offer a safer route. But then can we get all the way to our climb on the old snow? Or are we exposing ourselves to an avalanche track runout zone? Um, that we can't see up in the cloud? Are there other climbers up in the cloud? Are, are, are there cornices in the cloud? And can we exit our route safely? So there's a lot of unknowns there which mean that it might be better just to leave it for another day. Um, when it comes to skiing, are we sure that we're not being influenced by what appears to be fantastic conditions? Do we have any mission creep where um, we're beginning to creep onto slopes that earlier in the day we decided that uh, were, weren't a good idea. Have you set boundaries carefully, communicated the boundaries? Does everyone know where is uh, appropriate and not? Um, and are your safe uh, stopping points actually safe? Are they really out with any tracks or run out zones? And has this all been communicated uh, carefully and everyone understand? So at the end of the day, when it comes to the human factors at the key place, this is your last chance to get it right. And if there is un any uncertainty, then perhaps it's better to use your alternative plan, which might be just going home. And at the end of the day, if you can sit down and uh, review or reflect on the day um, and try and extract any learning, it could be that the forecast was correct and everything went as planned. But just having a little bit of uh, time at the end of the day to reflect on how um, you felt physically and mentally and the, the cruxes of the day for you might help you plan any future days out. 
Uh, thank you for listening and remember you can ask uh, your instructors plenty of questions on the hill.